All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we have a great, great, great uh, panel set for you, and glad that everyone can join us. Um, and to join, join us to kick off um, our 2022 match cycle, too. My name is Adobe Okocha. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a fourth year medical student at Meharry Medical College, and I serve as one of the co directors for Future Peds Res this year. Um, we also have my co director, uh, Tyler Boyne's mom. And do you want to? Actually, I do. Um, my name is Tyler Brunsma. I'm uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm a fourth year student um, at Penn State College of Medicine in the sweetest place on earth in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, and I'll be serving as the other co-director for Future Peds that res this year. I'm going to let Adobe take it away today because unfortunately I have a little bit of a case of uh, para influenza. Um, so she will be taking the lead, but I'll be in the background um, fielding questions and um, passing them on to her. Thank you, Tyler. Feel better. Um, so first and foremost, before getting started, we definitely want to highlight our founders um, here at Future Peds Res, who are now uh, first year interns, uh, Mekala and Nick. And I believe Nick is here to join us. Um, Nick, do you have a few words for the audience or a quick hello? Hello, everybody. I, I wasn't prepared for this, but you guys are in great hands. I think one of the best things about Peds Match 22 and last year Peds Match uh, 21 is that truly everybody is in it together. Everybody has each other's backs and best interests. So you have such a great year ahead of you, an awesome future Peds Res team for this year. Um, and I can't wait to see what happens. Best of luck to everybody this year. Yeah, I'd uh, like to just piggyback on that and say how excited I am. This is such a surreal feeling to be on the audience side of the Peds Match 22 webinar series. And I mean, I couldn't be prouder um, of this incredible team. And like Nick said, truly good luck to all of you. And we're, we're all in this together. Thank you all. Um, we would also like to take the moment to acknowledge Dr. John Frona. Um, he is the Vice Chair of Education and part of the APPD Recruitment Action Team and Ms. Colleen Hughes, the Associate Executive Director, both of whom um, have helped make these webinars a reality as well. So thank you to both of them um, for really, you know, making this happen for us. Now getting started, we would like to uh, briefly introduce our amazing webinar team. And that includes Ryan Morales, Jessica Mutters, Sana Ashraf, uh, Nicole Andres. Um, they have all been working and preparing for our upcoming regional webinars. In addition, we have two members of our equity team, um, Erica Noel uh, Barron and Lamia Mohammed, who have been hard at work uh, preparing our Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine and International Medical Graduate webinars respectively. And you all will get to meet these wonderful people in the upcoming weeks, so stay tuned. Um, we're excited once again to have you here with us and hope that the information imparted today will leave you with some gems to hold on to. To start us off, we would love to introduce you to um, Dr. April Buchanan and Dr. Becky Blankenberg to provide a brief overview of this application season um, and the interview and application guidelines. And Dr. April Buchanan, she serves as the president of Comcep, as well as the associate dean for curriculum and professor of pediatrics at the University of South Carolina um, School of Medicine in Greenville. In her clinical practice, she sees patients as a pediatric hospitalist at Prisma Health. Dr. Becky Blankenberg, she serves as the president of the Association of Pediatric Program Directors, as well as the associate chair of education in the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford University. In her clinical practice, she sees patients as a pediatric hospitalist at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Please help me welcome Dr. Buchanan and Dr. Blankenberg. Thank you right. so much. April, would you like to introduce Comsep first? Sure, I'll get us started. So I'm really excited to be here and to welcome all of you. Um, just a little bit about Comsep, we're the Council on Medical Student Education in Pediatrics. And you know, our vision is better help for all patients through pediatric education. So many of our members are your pediatric educators at your schools of medicine, um, both the clerkship directors and some of the post-clerkship directors, as well as some of the folks who teach in pre-clerkship. 
So many of these individuals advise you. Um, and so we definitely have several groups um, who are very interested in helping you through this process. And um, we're just excited to be part of the webinar tonight. Um, we do also have our past president, uh, Joe Gigante, and our president-elect, Lajay Bhutani, on the call as well. So uh, welcome from the CONCEPT team. Outstanding. Thank you. And I want to say a special thank you to Adobe and Tyler. I know April and I are um, indebted to you for your leadership of Future Peds Res and also wanted to do a special call out to uh, Nick Heitkamp and uh, Meklin and Neely Canton for your incredible leadership this past year through a, a tumultuous and always changing year. I think you found ways of celebrating and bringing our community together in um, ways that will long last past the pandemic and just really thank you for that partnership. I'm Becky Blankenberg. I'm the president of the Association of Pediatric Program Directors. We are a group of 4,200 members who are uh, residency program leadership, so program directors, associate program directors, chief residents, coordinators, um, and many other educational leaders and fellowship directors and, and their whole fellowship leadership teams. And so we're very committed to helping you uh, through this process this year. Next slide. April and I wanted to emphasize that most important of everything, you have chosen a great field. The field of pediatrics is an incredible field and there's nothing more rewarding than caring for children and families. And um, we just have been through a several day conference re-envisioning what the future of pediatrics looks like and how we can continue to improve upon an amazing field. And um, the energy that was in the Zoom room as we thought about this and the ways in which we've seen pediatricians and pediatric trainees advocate for patients and families, do research for patients and families, improve health systems, um, take care of them on a one-on-one -on -one level, teach. There are so many different ways that you can impact the field of pediatrics. So regardless, you've chosen the right field and we're really excited to welcome you in. Next slide. So we formed this uh, recruitment action team predating the pandemic. Uh, Joe Gigante, the past COMSA president, um, and I and a, a huge team, including many on this call, put together this team really with the idea of how do we optimize the recruitment process for both applicants and programs by helping applicants, helping all of you find the program that match your career interests um, while providing an atmosphere that's conducive to your learning styles and learning perspectives. And then how do we create a fair and equitable application process for all applicants and programs? And um, as I said earlier, Nick and Makla, and now we're excited that Adobe and Tyler are huge parts of, of this work um, and ongoing as we think about how we further optimize the process. Next slide. We did want to share with you a few of our big picture recommendations to our pediatrics community for this year. And the biggest one that we came out with over a month ago is that we are recommending virtual interviews for this year. Um, we are exploring if we should do virtual interviews uh, beyond this year, but certainly for this year, we found for a number of reasons that virtual interviews really optimize the process. It has allowed programs and applicants to get a really effective assessment of the other programs. It has allowed um, there to be more equity in the process. We know that the recruitment process is a very expensive process. And so the more that we can make it an equitable environment um, for financially, so that for those applicants from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, um, we know that there's been a disproportionate impact from COVID-19 pandemic on some applicants and some programs. And we also know that there's still uncertainty going into this year, and we don't know what travel restrictions or um, other health restrictions there might be for some individual applicants or some regions of the country. In addition, um, as I was saying before, it has been a huge cost savings for applicants. Um, it also has been a cost savings for programs. 
And then it, we know that your educational time is incredibly important and has been disrupted because of the pandemic. And so we want to optimize your clinical time and your um, other elective time as much as possible. And we found that by decreasing travel, that helps do that. And finally, there was a really compelling paper that came out this year on the environmental impact of in-person versus virtual recruitment. And as we continue to think about um, global warming and the impact that we're making on the environment, uh, we felt like this was another way in which we could um, further look out for the health of our children and families and communities. Next slide. The other recommendations that we made to our programs this year, so you understand what we're telling the programs, is uh, we believe very strongly in a holistic review, in looking at your entire application, who you are, what you've done thus far, um, what you're passionate about. And that has been a goal of ours for the last many years. And we've done a lot of faculty development um, and program development to help people be able to do that. In addition, we recommended uh, to the programs that they not have swag. Swag are those uh, pens or, or, or coffee cups or pads of paper that have the, have the institution's name on it. We found that, um, the, I should say the residents and the students who were on our team told us that they didn't think it influenced people's decisions. And yet it was one more thing that programs were doing that might bring inequity to the different programs. We also recommended that programs and applicants not write love letters to each other. This is a recommendation to really try to not put pressure on you as applicants um, to either uh, know how to respond to one of those, those quote unquote love letters or feel like you need to write them. We don't need them as program directors and we really respect um, that this is a really individualized process and individual reasons go into your decision and uh, the rank list is sufficient for that, for letting us know where you wanna be. And finally, we recommended to programs that they offer the number of spots um, that, that they not over offer interviews for the number of spots they have. So with this, I'll hand it over to April who has some of our recommendations for applicants this year. Great, next slide. So specifically for the applicants, we really recommend that um, you apply to no more than 20 programs unless you have a significant academic difficulty or red flag. Now saying that, it's extremely important to look at the level of competitiveness of the programs to which you're applying um, and the applicant. So sort of way, is this a uh, you know, reach for me? Is this a solid place given, you know, kind of where I am in my application and my abilities and what um, other people have given me advice around and try to make that a good match so that you have a lot of solid middle programs and then a few reaches. And then if you feel sometimes it may be, hey, I almost feel overqualified for this program, that's great to have on your, on your list. And that way you really are applying to the appropriate places. Um, and I would also say that you know, really make sure you're getting good advice from individuals knowledgeable of the match process. So your school should be making a strong effort to identify individuals who are, you know, really knowledgeable in the area of um, pediatric match and education, and they should be able to help you. you say, well, what do you mean by competitive programs or how competitive an applicant am I? And this really gives you a chance to sit with someone and have those conversations. And again, we really recommend that you do that. Um, and I see a, a question in the chat that I saw pop across about couples matches. And I will say that that is a different um, setup. It really depends on what the other person um, is um, matching in. And um, usually it does require more applications. And again, I would use your career advisors, um, specialty advisors in that process. Next slide. Um, so how are you going to learn more about this process? Um, we are so excited to partner, as Becky mentioned, with um, the Future Peace groups. And so they're actually going to be there. Um, I saw a question about IMGs. Um, and, you know, again, I would talk a little bit more with your advisors on where you're applying. Um, and that would help tailor your list. But sometimes, again, that may require may require more than the recommendation but there will be a special session to ask some of those specific questions on August 3rd, a DO session on August 5th, 
And then you'll see the dates here of all the regional sessions um, that will allow you to meet some of the different programs. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, but again, um, please use the folks who are CONCEPT members at your institutions. And I imagine for most of you, that will be some of the specialty advisors, clerkship directors, post-clerkship directors. I think, I mean, oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Buchanan. Thank you, Dr. Blankenberg. Um, for one, the welcome, of course, and um, also for imparting this information on how to get off to a great start during this interview season. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Amanda Osta, who will be sharing with us how to put our best foot forward virtually. And Dr. Amanda Osta is the ass Assistant Dean of Advising and Career Planning at University of Illinois, Chicago. She completed her medical school at Loyola Stritch University or sorry, School of Medicine um, in Chicago, and then went on to complete a combined MedPeds residency at the University of Michigan, where she served as a chief internal medicine resident. Dr. Osta started on faculty at UIC as the Associate Pedi Pediatric Program Director in 2008 and became the Pediatric Residency Program Director in 2010. She served in the role as a pediatric residency program director for a decade before she stepped down in March 2020 in order to become the assistant dean of advising and career planning. Her research interests are screening for toxic stress in pediatric patients and building resilience in patients and trainees. She is thrilled to be here today to share all that she has learned in the last year about supporting students through the virtual interview process. Dr. Rasta, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me today. It's really my pleasure. I think last year I did this session with a lot of trepidation um, about what it might look like to have a virtual interview process. Uh, and I feel much better prepared, I guess, this time to assist you with this um, process. So I'm really pleased to be with you today. Um, and I think as Becky already said, um, you joined an amazing field. Um, you will have a lot of success. I think you'll really enjoy the interview process. I heard from many students um, in all fields, but particularly in pediatrics, that they really did get to a feel a good feel of the programs, even through the virtual process. Everyone kind of was nervous about that. Um, and program directors uh, were really pleased uh, with their new trainees. Um, and the trainees were really happy where they matched. So um, I think just all of that to say, um, we've done this once now, so this is not the first time and we're really excited to help you with this process today. So I'm gonna be talking today very specifically on how to put your best kind of virtual self uh, forward. And I'll say um, in order to prepare for this presentation, I did a lot of the things that I'm gonna tell you um, to do actually just today. So um, we're gonna uh, go through my process here with you. So next slide. Okay, so before you do, uh, and um, I have a bunch of resources at the end. And one of the uh, one of the resources I'm going to highlight at the end is um, an AAP um, um, uh, 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 the Society for Pediatric Trainees of Pediatric Trainees, and they have a really good webinar on this. So I would really highly recommend um, going there. But I try to kind of like distill that down for you. So before the interviews, there's quite a lot of things that you're want to do uh, before the interviews. You're going to want to set up your interview location. Now, some of you may do that at your medical school, which is great. Others of you may do it in your home um, environment, which is also fine. So whichever uh, one you want to do, the medical schools um, should help to provide a location for you if you can't do it in your um, home environment. So you can start talking to your medical schools about that. You'll want to check your audio um, and check your video. So uh, when I uh, logged on to this, that was the very first question I asked was, can you hear me? Is there an echo? Is there a back, uh, lot of background noise? Um, so that uh, then I could make adjustments if need be. Um, you're going to want to um, check your platform. So some programs are obviously going to use Zoom. Others might use Teams. There's going to be a variety of different platforms that you uh, might use. And I think we've all gotten comfortable in the one that our home institution uses, and we're a little bit less comfortable in other of them. Um, so you may want to uh, just check the platform um, and try it out before uh, your interview process. 
Um, ideally, you would check it out at least 24 hours um, ahead of time. Um, that being said, if your interview is on a Monday, you probably don't want to check it out on Sunday because the coordinator who you'll be communicating with um, may not be available on Sunday evening at 6 p.m. when you realize that you don't have what you need. So I would try to do it at least 24 to 48 business hours um, ahead of time. Um, you'll want to double check your interview times. Uh, those of you who are on the West Coast, uh, you may be interviewing on East Coast times and vice versa. So you want to kind of know what um, interview time that you're interviewing in. Um, ideally, you're going to practice with a friend, somebody from your medical school, an advisor, a mock interview, one of those types of things. And then you want to plan your interview outfit. And we're going to talk through all of these uh, different scenarios. Next slide. Okay, so um, we talked a little bit about this, checking your technology beforehand. Um, I think all of us know this by now, um, a phone is really hard to keep steady for a long time. So um, trying to use either a laptop, um, an iPad or a tablet, um, those are better. Um, you do wanna check your uh, webcam and microphone with whatever specific video platform um, that you're using. Make sure your laptop is plugged in, even if you have a full battery at the beginning. I think all of us have been in the middle of a meeting where suddenly we realize, uh oh, something's not right here, I, I need something. So make sure that you're um, plugged in. If you're using wireless headphones, make sure that those are charged um, ahead of time. Um, if your Wi-Fi is shaky, then um, use an ethernet cable or try to change to an alternative location. Um, if you have um, a profile picture, you can put up a profile picture. Um, I would just make sure that profile picture is professional and you could use your Aris photo um, for that. That would be perfect. Um, when you get in, make sure you have the right name. I can't tell you the number of times I've logged on to a Zoom and my kids have changed the name to something maybe that wouldn't be the most professional. Um, so just make sure that you have the right name. Uh, you can put your pronouns um, on your Zoom name. So I think that's really helpful as well. And then practice with your peers um, and uh, advisors. I think it's helpful to record yourself so you can hear what you sound like um, during the process, not only your um, tempo of speech, but the, how much echo you have, uh, those types of things. All right, so um, you'll hopefully remove anyone in your immediate vicinity um, that might make your life a little bit more difficult. Today, I knew I was going to be doing this and my, I knew my son had a drum lesson at exactly at this time. So rather than working from home, um, I wanted to make sure I would be in a place that it would be uh, quiet and I wouldn't be interrupted. Um, turn off any device notifications. It can be really distracting to have your emails popping up or any sort of like iPhone messages or whatever coming up. Uh, you really want to treat this much differently than you've treated other aspects of your Zoom life. So you really don't, you really want to be very engaged as much as you can. Um, if you typically use two screens, it's better just to use the one screen for interviews. That way you won't be kind of like glancing off um, so you can really be engaged. Um, you want to silence, of course, yourself phone, if you have a home phone, I don't know if anyone does anymore, but you know, turn that off. Um, if you have notifications on your Apple Watch, you want to um, remove those so you don't get distracted. And then um, I think we've all seen uh, cats kind of like uh, walking across all of our screens or a dog barking in the background. Of course, these things may happen. Um, but if you can proactively remove those, um, that can be very helpful. All right, so your interview location, um, it should be hopefully quiet um, and hopefully you can minimize interruptions. You may get an interruption and I think we'll, I'll talk about it in another um, couple of slides, but sometimes how you react to those interruptions um, will help to determine kind of how well you do in your interview. So that's um, okay. I think all of us will have some amount of um, on toward events um, during all of this time. Uh, and it's just important kind of how you react during those. Um, the background, so I spent a lot of time today trying to figure out how to best set up my background. This is not where I normally sit. This is actually on the opposite end of where I normally sit. I have a uh, wi window in, in front of me so that I'm well front lit. Um, and then I, you can see behind me, I just have a couple of um, a couple of things. You could have just a blank wall, that's fine. Uh, if you have a bookshelf, they say remove um, uh, a lot of the books on the bookshelf. Um, that may 
uh, help you so that it doesn't look so busy. Um, some programs will give you a virtual background and if they do, that's great to use. Um, I think that helps to minimize uh, bias. And so if a program um, uh, emails you a virtual background ahead of time, uh, that can be really helpful. Um, when I was just talking to Becky at the beginning, she said that some students had trouble loading those virtual backgrounds. So that you something else you may, may just wanna um, start again, uh, try again before you um, uh, go, go ahead with your interview. Next slide. Um, so headphones, uh, depends on kind of like what your environment is like. Um, they often will help to minimize background noise and echo, like we talked about before, make sure your wireless headphones are charged. Um, and then just record yourself, concentrate really on how you sound and how you look, practice interviewing with a friend, um, somebody who can give you really good uh, constructive feedback. Uh, those are all really uh, great things to do. Um, check your video, um, have, have yourself be front lit, um, try to put natural light in front of you, that'll help to minimize shadows. Um, on one of my, one of these, I'll, I have a picture of a ring light, I think many of us have invested in those. They're like between 15, 10 and $20 um, and it helps to minimize kind of shadows. So you put, it's a light that you put really just on the front of your, um, of your computer uh, that can help to minimize shadows that kind of is in your face. Um, the one thing I would caution you a little bit with the lighting is just if you have glasses, sometimes you're going to need to adjust like where the lighting goes so there's not too much of a reflection in your glasses. So you might uh, want to look kind of closely look into that. Uh, clean your camera before you do an interview with a microfiber clap microfiber cloth that'll help to kind of like brighten things up and then put your camera right at eye height. I have um, uh, actually Rudolph's pediatrics book underneath my um, laptop right now to kind of bump up my laptop. And you can see there's some photos if you do this incorrectly, kind of what it looks like if you're really backlit, it can be hard to see. And then ideally you have just yourself right at eye level uh, rather than kind of like looking down um, or looking up. So really ideally just at eye level. Um, so when you practice with your friend or your uh, in your virtual or your mock interview with your school, um, ask people, how's your lighting? How are your shadows? What's the best distance from the camera to self? You don't want to be like here taking up the whole screen, nor do you want to be like all the way back here. So you kind of want to practice uh, kind of what's the best distance. Are you moving your hands too much? So if you're a person who moves their hands a little bit, that's great. You want to be careful not to kind of like wave your hands in front of the screen. So if you're somebody who use, utilizes your hands a lot, you kind of want to be cautious about where they go. Um, and then um, how's your eye line? Some people um, find just Zoom very distracting because you're constantly looking at yourself. You can minimize your self view or high your self view so that then you're solely looking at the interviewer um, and that can be really helpful too so that you're not uh, looking at yourself. Um, some people like to put a smiley face or a post-it note up by your camera to remind you to like look up and keep your eyes up. Um, okay, so what to, to think about with appearance, um, they say to use um, solid colors with contrasting. So this morning, as I was trying to figure out what to wear, you can see I like wore two different contrasting colors. They say not too much patterns, um, because I guess the pattern like, gets kind of like pixelated and can look a little bit strange. Um, they say not 100% black or 100% white. Um, so a little bit of contrast is what they say. Um, wear an entire outfit. We've all seen, of course, people getting up and like they have a suit coat on and they're only in their shorts on the bottom, you know, something happens, you have to go answer your door or something along those lines. Um, they say, they recommend wearing shoes um, during it that you'll feel, I guess, a little bit more comfortable and prepared. Um, like somebody already put in the chat, um, use a stationary chair so that you're not like swiveling the whole time. Um, in addition, they say that with a ceiling fan. Um, if you have a ceiling fan going, make sure that that's not um, causing a lot of distraction because that can be dizzying for the interviewer. Um, so either try to turn off the ceiling fan or just make sure that the lights aren't kind of flashing with the ceiling fan. Um, really try to listen attentively, uh, just as you would with uh, in a face to face conversation. They say to sit a little bit on the edge of your um, chair. So you kind of like lean forward a little bit. Um, and so that makes you look a little bit more engaged rather than kind of sitting all the way back. So as you would, I guess, in an actual interview. 
So the day of interview, try to join a few minutes early. This will allow you for uh, any tech challenges. If something happens with your audio, of course, you can use the chat. Make sure you have the coordinator's uh, best number to reach the coordinator at or best email address to reach the coordinator at uh, if there are any tech challenges so that then you can get re-engaged. If your um, video suddenly goes out or your um, internet is not working, um, you can go ahead and, oh, I think just go one slide forward, sorry. Um, um, uh, the, the phone number so that it, you can just, you know, interview by phone if need to. Um, try to speak slowly and clearly. This is something I'm not very good at is speaking slowly. So it's something I always have to kind of try to keep on my mind. Um, try not to be distracted by, we talked about that figuring out where you want to put your hands, keep your water nearby in case you need a sip of something. And then if you want to take notes, just say like, oh, I just want to write something down so that they don't think that you're, you know, scrolling on Twitter or whatever else you might be doing during that time. Um, so you're most likely will meet with um, other trainees and small groups. Um, and just to remember that to, to try to remain engaged in all aspects of the interview process. So not only on your one on one interviews, but when you're in small groups with other trainees, um, if you need a break, just let somebody know like I need a break, um, go ahead and uh, take it and I'll be right back, turn off your camera and then re engage once you're ready to. Um, you can always, of course, have some stock questions with you that you can use in small groups with residents. These are just some examples. You can use anything you want. What are good books you're reading? What, what's your favorite TV show? Where do you like to go for dinner? What do you do outside the hospital? Just have some stock questions that you can kind of ask people. And then just go with the flow. I think um, Blair Dickinson put that in the chat already. If your audio is not working, just call in. Whatever occurs, be flexible. Um, as you improvise throughout all of this, this could be perceived as a great asset um, when it comes to programs thinking about who they want in a resident. We all know residency is not a smooth um, process at all times. So somebody who's able to really um, kind of perform under a stressful situation can be a huge asset and can really um, keep you standing out. So don't worry about it. It's going to happen. It's happened to all of us um, during this last uh, year. And I know to all of us during interview season as well. I think there's some just tips and this these slides will be posted um, that YouTube video is really good from the AAP Society on uh, trainees. I think that's a really wonderful one and you should watch that. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Osta. Um, and thank you for the virtual tips. There's some things that you know we don't think about, but these are crucial. So thank you so much for sharing these. Next, we will transition into our panel discussion uh, for the night. Our panelists will be answering our future PEDS questions, as well as questions from Twitter, um, some that we collected from Instagram, and also here in Zoom. As a reminder throughout the webinar, if you have a question to ask, um, you can feel free to tweet it and add the hashtag uh, FPR webinar or drop it in the, Q, uh, the Q and A chat here. And um, that can be found of course at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. For our first panelist, we have Dr. Kenya McNeil Trice. Um, Dr. Kenya McNeil Trice is a professor in uh, Vice Chair of Education in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. She earned her BS in Biology from Spelman College and an MD from Wayne State University School of Medicine. She completed her pediatric residency training at UNC Hospitals, North Carolina Children's Hospital, and afterwards served as a pediatric chief resident at Wake Med Hospitals in Raleigh, North Carolina. In 2007, Dr. McNeil Trice joined the faculty at UNC School of Medicine as an assistant professor and assumed a leadership role as associate director of medical student education and pediatrics. In 2010, she was appointed the director of medical student education programs in pediatrics and became the pediatric residency program director in 2014. Dr. McNeil Trice was then appointed the chief graduate medical education officer ACGM, ACGME designated institutional official at University of North Carolina Hospitals and the Senior Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in January, 2021. In her role, Dr. McNeil Trice is responsible for the educational components and operations of the GME programs at the UNC hospitals 
and UNC School of Medicine Chapel Hill campus. She oversees over 90 ACGME accredited programs and nearly 1,000 trainees. Dr. McNeil Trice is a member of the Education and Training Committee for the American Board of Pediatrics and currently serves as an elected member of the AAMC Steering Committee for the Group in Women in Science and Medicine. In addition, she's a Chair of Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the, Academic, of the Academic Pediatric Association and Vice President of the North Carolina Pediatric Society. Um, that's NC chapter of the AAP. Dr. McNeil Trice has dedicated her career to implementing curricula and policies promoting an equitable and inclusive learning environment at all levels of academic medicine. Thank you for joining us, Dr. McNeil Trice. Next up, we have Dr. Emily borman -Shop. Um, Dr. Emily borman -Shop is an associate professor and the vice chair of education at the University of Minnesota. She has had the privilege of serving as residency program director for the past nine years and has been a member of the residency leadership team at the University of Minnesota since 2006. Her areas of interest include competency-based medical education, curricular innovation, and mentorship. The most rewarding part of her job is providing individualized support and guidance to help every resident along their journey. Thank you as well for joining us, Dr. borman Show. Next, we have Dr. Timothy Lefebvre, uh, who attended medical school at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee before completing his residency and chief residency in pediatrics at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. He joined the pediatric and adolescent group practice at West Virginia University in 2013 and is an associate professor of pediatrics in the WVU School of Medicine. He served as an associate program director for the pediatric residency program from 2015 to 2017, and has served as a program director since 2017. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Lefebvre. And finally, we have Dr. Heather McPhillips. She's currently a professor in the Clinician Educator Pathway at University of Washington. She dedicates 70% of her effort to graduate medical education in her role as residency director and 30% of her effort to clinical work. She was an associate residency director for 12 years and the residency director for the past eight and has led and collaborated on the development of innovative curricula and a research project related to graduate medical education. Her clinical activities are in the division of general pediatrics where she attends on the inpatient general medicine service at Seattle Children's Hospital and in the newborn nursery and continuity clinic at University of uh, Washington Medical Center. In addition to local leadership roles, Dr. McPhillips has served as co-chair of the Associate Program Director Special Interest Group and chair of the Research Task Force for the Association of Pediatric Program Directors. She has also served on the National Board of Medical Examiners um, Children's Health Committee and she's currently a national advisor for the Academic Pediatric Association Educational Scholars Program and a member of the Pediatric Residency Review Committee for the ACGM, ACGME on the board of the, and on the board of the Association of Pediatric Program Directors. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. McPhillips. Um, now we'll have our panelists answer some set questions and from then kick off our Q&A session. So starting off, we have a question for Dr. borman Shope. Um, how do applicants show interest and market themselves to programs with limited away rotations and virtual interviews? Thanks very much. I'm so uh, happy to be here. I um, took you at your word when you said brief bio. I did med school at Washington University in St. Louis, and I did my residency here at University of Minnesota, just if you went a little more on my path. Um, Number one, you show interest by applying to our program. That is the most clear way you can show us you are interested. And honestly, that is your first step. So I think you'll be ready to do that when ARIS opens uh, in a few weeks. I, when I saw the wording of that question at first, I was like, oh gosh, I hate that they feel like they have to market themselves. But I do um use that analogy with students a lot when they come to meet with me that your application packet is like the little commercial about you and um i've done some workshops and thinking about how can we think about our brand as an individual like what are your strengths what are the things you're proud of what do you bring to the table that's unique about you as an applicant and the thing i really encourage you to do 
as you're going through the somewhat tedious steps of making your ARIS application is just telling that story in every part of your application. So when you're writing your personal statement, when you're doing your noteworthy characteristics in your MSPE, even when you're listing your research opportunities or your volunteer activities in ARIS aren't there yet, but when you get there, there's a section where you can say like, explain more about this activity. And that's a great way, like, I don't need to know that you pipetted the thing in the gel and whatever, but you might say like, I really learned that I love answering clinical questions and applying it to patients. And I got really interested in tick-borne diseases after I did that research project. So use every part of your ARIS application to paint the picture of the things that are important to you and what you would bring to a program. So I think use ARIS to your best advantage, apply to the program. Those are your first steps. And you can start to get a sense for, we'll be talking about this later, I'm sure, are the programs I'm looking at, do they match up? So I'm, I'm marketing myself, here's my interest. When I look at this program's website, do those two things seem like they match well? And if the answer is yes, you're probably um, applying to the right programs. After you've applied, give us some time. We receive a large number of applications. But if you have not heard from us after two or three weeks, send a specific email that says, I'm really interested in your program for X, Y, and Z reasons. I think I would be a great fit because of these interests of mine. Please take a look at my application. I'd love to interview with you. We love getting those emails because that lets us know that you've specifically thought about our program and how it would be a good fit for you. You don't need to send us that right now. It's too soon, we're not ready, you're not ready. So get your application ready first. We'll probably just invite you if it's clear that our interests and your interests match up, but don't be afraid to send an email like that say, hey, here's what I have to offer. I know you've got a lot of applications, but I think this is what would make me a great fit for your program. So those are some initial thoughts and I'm happy to answer questions. I'll tweet out um, an article that I helped to write about just thinking about branding. I think as pediatricians, most of us are naturally quite humble people and we don't like to brag about our accomplishments or our skills. So I would just say, center yourself in thinking about how much you like taking care of kids and their families and how much you're going to like doing that and do it through that lens. Find a way to brag about yourself that can feel comfortable, but I know that can be a challenge sometimes. So sometimes you might need your friends to help you. Oh, remember you did that thing and you organized the, you know, 5k and raised $10,000. You should talk about that. So ask your friends to help think about how to market yourself too. That's in, in your advisors, of course, the faculty who work with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Borman Um, Next, we have our second question directed to Dr. McPhillips. Um, given the, res the virtual nature of this season, how should applicants get to know the culture of a residency program? Um, and that's a great question. And I think that was something that we were all um, really worried about going virtual last year, because that is something that as program directors and EPDs and chief residents and our residents, we all really um, think that's such an important part of how you choose a program. Um, and it didn't, it worked out, it really worked out. So I, I for, for one thing, I'd just be reassured that um, we we did get a good sense of people over Zoom and I think they got a good sense of us. And it, um, on the interview day, I think, you know, how you structure your interview day, um, your interviews that you have and kind of the questions you ask and how they responded. And then hopefully you'll have opportunities. Um, most programs will have some sort of, unfortunately Zoom social gathering, but some Zoom social gatherings um, you know, we used to have kind of happy hours at, um, a couple times a week for people who applied and it's, you know, not the same on Zoom, but I still think you get a really good sense of um, the, the way the residents interact with each other. If you can um, attend a teaching conference and see how um, virtually, obviously, um, how that goes, I think our, 
our teaching conferences were all virtual last year. They're going much more into in-person this year. So I don't know how much of an opportunity that will be for you all, but um, at each individual program, but I think it's worthwhile if you have a chance. And then I would say the other really important source are people that are currently in the program that might be alumni from your medical school or from your undergraduate or your uncle's undergraduate. <laughs> um, you know, usually that's available on the website or if not the residency coordinator, coordinator might be able to put you in touch with somebody um, if you can't find anybody that has a connection. But if you email them, in general, people are really excited to talk about um, the different programs that they have. Um, uh, my associate program director was just leaving a post-it note. Speaking of disruptions, Amanda, <laughs> to tell me something. Um, and um, I think that, you know, ask a lot of questions in your interview, come prepared. Um, unlike medical school interviews, I think residency interviews oftentimes are really a, kind of a mutual interview. We want you all to find a great fit. There are so many good pediatric residency programs out there. Um, to choose from. Um, so we we love when you ask us for questions that show that you've you know sort of looked into our program and have specific ideas. And and I think um, as those get answered, especially by um, faculty and residents, you get you get a real flavor for kind of what the values of the program are, where their curricular in, um, emphasis uh, emphasis emphasis are, um, and um, and then you know investigate the city because where you're going to live for the next three years is also really really important. Um, what people ask questions about what people do outside of work. And, um, you know, I think that's uh, oftentimes people end up in the region where they train. So um, pay close attention to that. And I think those are the real specific tips I would have. But I, I overall just want you guys to have such a sense of um, reassurance that you will get a vibe, you will get in, you will get that gut check just like um, you did in person, and we were surprised that that happened as well on Zoom, but um, it, but it really does. And I'll just close by saying that I'm breaking all of Amanda's rules because I'm not on Zoom in my office usually this late, and the sun is just beaming in on my face, so I apologize if I'm in shadow. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McPhillips. Next, we have our third question for Dr. Lefebvre. What are important program attributes that applicants should consider when deciding where to apply for a residency? Great, thank you. Um, and thanks again for inviting me to be here. I think I'm one of the, I guess, less uh, seasoned folks up here, but um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share these things. Um, I think there's a lot of overlap with um, what Heather is saying about culture. I think culture is one of the most important things that you wanna glean from a program. And that goes into what does it feel like when you interact with the people, whether it's the people you're interviewing with, the residents, um, what is the sense you get from them as to what it's actually like? Because again, in a virtual environment, um, that is very different than being in person, but it's still something you wanna get a sense of. And I think the other part of culture is what does the, what is the Department of Pediatrics, the Children's Hospital, um, the institution in general, what does that feel like? Um, is pediatrics growing? Um, is there a welcoming environment in the community? Is it involved in the community? You want to get a sense of what the institution stands for, what they're doing, in addition to the, the people you work with every day, because I think that's super important. Um, the other thing is lifestyle. This is another kind of overlapping topic, but you want to be in a place where you're going to be happy and comfortable, and it has to align with what you want um, for those next three years of your life. And that involves geography, um, support systems, I think are incredibly important. So if you're gonna go to a program that's hundreds of miles away um, in different time zones, and it's gonna be a challenge for you to be in contact with your supports, um, you have to consider that. Cost of living, entertainment, what do the residents do um, for fun? What's available? You know, we in West Virginia, um, we're a very small residency program. We only take six categorical red, uh, residents per year, um, but it's a great outdoors place. So our residents love to do things outdoors and that's that's what we're about. So I think that's very important too. And then I think, um, you know, the bottom line is training, right? The nuts and bolts. What is it gonna be like to be a resident here? What What is the schedule like? What do I rotate on? Will I get good exposure to what I want my career path to be? I think those are really important questions you wanna ask up front. Um, and then the other pieces of that would go with the educational programming or conferences like how, how much autonomy are residents given in teaching 
um, and in the education piece of the program. So uh, again, nuts and bolts are important to learn about and they fit in with what it's really gonna be like to be a resident there. So I think those are the big three things um, I would say you wanna look at when you're thinking about a program. And the way to glean those are, are to get, ask as many questions as you can um, when you're doing your virtual interviews because it does help get those answers. Thank you so much, Dr. Lefebvre. Next, we have our fourth question for Dr. Kenya McNeil Trice. What stands out, both good and bad, in a virtual interview and or also in an application? Wow, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate you all giving me this question because I feel like it's a slow ball uh, going last because you all covered a lot of what I would cover. Um, when Amanda pulled out her PowerPoint, I was like, whoa, this is like, <laughs> I was like, she's got it all straight. I love it. Um, so I'll, I'm gonna try to just um, go briefly through some highlights that I thought about. And then um, I know that there's an opportunity maybe to ask some questions um, before the resident panel. Um, with regards to things um, um, or re-emphasizing um, aspects within your application, um, I wanted to hit on some high points. Um, I always recommend individuals with, your, with regards to your personal statement to proofread it. Um, grammatical and spe spelling errors stand out. Um, remember individuals that are reading your personal statements, we are all super type A. And so we like, <laughs> we hone in on like a, a misspelled word or something right away. And, and what it just, what it can demonstrate is like, wow, they didn't really proofread. Were they serious about this? I'm not quite sure. And so I always tell individuals, um, just to make sure that it's accurate. Um, it does not have to be a spectacular personal statement. Um, my statement oftentimes is individuals, um, medical students spend the majority of their time um, oftentimes perseverating and stressing out over their personal statement. Um, we probably spend the least amount of time perseverating and stressing out over your personal statement. Um, we just wanna read why you, about your journey. It doesn't have to be super exciting. Um, and my biggest aspect is um, your personal statement shouldn't necessarily make you stand out, um, meaning sometimes individuals do some different and unique things and it may come across as weird. Um, <laughs> and so I, I tell you, if you're trying to think about taking a risk with the personal statement, don't, um, just be yourself um, and it will be just fine, I, I promise, all right? Um, um, with regards to your CV, um, uh, that you put in ERS. Um, I stress that there are meaningful experiences um, that um, are things that you um, truly were invested in. Um, it is not uncommon that we will get um, CVs or experiences where someone had, has done a plethora of, of, of activities. And you know, one of my thoughts is, wow, how did they have time for medical school? Um, so you don't have to put every um, single day um, food drive or 5K or everything that you may have done in medical school, but really focus in and be um, deliberate about those meaningful experiences um, because it's gonna have, the, the program directors are gonna be able to focus on that. Um, if there are a bunch of things that they're having to filter through, then you may, um, we may, you may miss the opportunity for us to actually notice something that does um, make you stand out or indicate a passion for you. So, so think about that if, as you're filtering through um, from that perspective. Um, I know this goes without saying with regards to telling the truth, um, but <laughs> tell the truth. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, with regards to especially some of your experiences and or research, um, be um, truthful about the extent of your experience and knowledge for that. Um, program directors and coordinators, we're actually deliberate about who you interview with in our programs. And so if you put that you did some level of research and were extensive in it, we're probably going to find, you know, the individual in our program that's an expert in that to interview you. And it's not to put you on the spot, but we're looking for someone that you will feel really comfortable with and easy to come up with conversation. Um, and so if you maybe are not as knowledgeable about that as you indicated on your CV, it can come across as awkward and negative. And so no need to embellish. Um, with regards to letters of recommendation, I think it's helpful to have someone that knows you um, and knows your experience. Um, I, I feel as though uh, us on this call, we're really experienced with leading, reading letters of recommendation. And sometimes we read letter, letters of recommendation that are not very good. 
meaning um, um, it not that it said bad things about the applicant, but the letter writer just wasn't really skilled at writing it, or it was obvious that they didn't have a lot to say about the applicant. Um, and so it comes off really short. Um, and so I think a letter of application, a letter of recommendation for me is much more meaningful for some from someone who actually knows you as an applicant than an individual who may have some big important title in your school or institution that you wanted to get their name, but they struggle to find five sentences to write. Um, um, I often say be authentic um, and not something that you're not. So what does that mean? Uh, I feel like oftentimes students stress about um, finding research opportunities and putting those on their application. And that's not what they're really passionate about. Um, they may be passionate about advocacy or global health, um, clinical um, care or research. And, and that needs to shine through on your application or you may uh, find yourself being um, attractive to programs that aren't a good fit for you. So highlight what's a good fit. Um, and I thought Amanda did a great job of talking about a professional picture um, on your application. One of the things we do actually when we um, um, screen for applications is actually we, we um, blind the picture. So we don't look at any of your photographs when we are selecting you for interviews. Um, and the first time we even see them is when we're preparing for the interview day and just to make sure that we can kind of recognize and make sure we have the right person for that day. And that's one of the things we do for bias um, to mitigate bias. Um, that being said, um, it is very memorable if your picture is perhaps not professional. Now you don't need to stand and be in regalia or a three piece suit or anything like that, um, but you also shouldn't take a selfie um, you know, in front of a Bud Light, um, um, you know, light at a bar and, um, I see some smiles on the screen, but that is that was an actual picture that we had submitted in ERAS before, literally the blue lights from Bud Light in the back. Um, with regards to interview, again, um, Dr. Ostra, she did a great job with that. Um, the good points to stand out, being attentive, um, absolutely. Um, being patient, um, things may, some things may go over, some things may happen early, being patient and not flustered by that. Um, adaptability and resilience is what most of us are looking for um, in a resident. And so it, it can show through on an interview day, um, your background not being distracting. Um, and um, I think one of the big things that we noticed that stood out for us is our um, applicants that interact with others. Um, on the Zoom process. And so, um, and when we say interact with others, interact with the interviewers, faculty and residents, but also interact with the other applicants. Um, that was a huge piece of what we often look for. And, um, and there are ways to do that and to do that in a respectful um, way. And so those are, I think those are all very good tips for the virtual interview. Um, and then last bad things that can stand out on the virtual interview, um, being late. Uh, so <laughs> that could stand out on any interview being late. Um, but um, we understand that there may be some things that happened um, um, and everybody, you know, everybody's human, um, but um, really being mindful about being prompt and on time and for virtual interviews, being prompt and on time, um, recommend signing on five to 10 minutes beforehand versus, uh, you know, showing up right on the dot. Because oftentimes most interview virtual interviews, they're waiting, they're waiting and counting for everyone to show up before they start and open, you know, release you from the waiting room or something. Um, if you turn your videos off, so most virtual interviews um, will, you know, have an opportunity for you to see a virtual conference or for you to, you know, interact in a larger group. Um, and um, for applicants that turn their videos off for us, um, we weren't quite sure why they did that. And so um, we were deliberate throughout the day with wanting to make sure applicants can eat and drink. And we would tell them during noon conference, please turn your videos off or during morning report, please turn off. We understand you're drinking coffee and things like that. But if you're in like a, a small group session and your video is off and nobody knows why, that can be a bit awkward. And so we, we had a couple applicants that would do that and they would chat and say, you know, I'm sorry, my cats having a fit over here or I apologize this or something and we were totally fine but if if we weren't quite sure it sounded it appeared that they were distracted um, and, um I always 
I know it goes without saying not to be rude. Most of us aren't rude, I hope so. Um, but uh, I think uh, for all program directors, um, the individuals that have the power of veto on the match list are our program coordinators. We live and die by our coordinators. They make our program run. And so if you are um, high maintenance or higher maintenance, um, don't respond to emails, um, um, ask for significant accommodations about when and where you like, it, it, and, or um, again, are rude to our coordinators, um, that, is, that is a no-go. Um, so, so being mindful of that, um, you wanna be truthful and mindful. And when I say truthful, um, our coordinators, they're coordinators for a reason and they know detail to a T. And so they know if they've sent you an email or something. And if, if you've missed it, I prefer a trainee say, you know what, I missed the email, I'm so sorry, versus you never sent it because the first time you say that that's when they go to their file and find every <laughs> every excel spreadsheet and so just be really mindful about that and accommodating i think virtual the biggest um, challenge with virtual interviews is is how to demonstrate your interest and i think this is something i would recommend practicing um, practicing how do i look interested looking into a camera do i nod am i smiling like what is my expression like almost like record yourself on a zoom um, because those expressions are going to have to be, um, unfortunately, a little bit more on display. Um, and when you appear disinterested, that's what individuals will remember um, about that. Um, and my last two things are um, canceling interviews late. Um, so um, most individuals know um, before the night before if they're not going to be able to attend an interview. Um, and um, that is a, a very bad sign um, if, um, for you to do that. Um, you may not be interested in that program anymore and all of a sudden decided it the night before or are too tired or whatever, um, but um, that interview um, spot could have been given to someone else that was interested. Um, and so it's professional courtesy. And um, I think it goes without saying, I, I, most of us know each other. I know every single person um, on this Zoom chat, who's a program director, despite the fact that I'm in North Carolina and somebody's in Illinois and somebody's in Washington and someone's in California, the world of pediatric residencies is very, very, very small. Very small. That's why I emphasize tell the truth <laughs> and be polite um, because the chances are you will either encounter that program or someone from that program again. Um, and the entire day is the interview. The whole day um, when you're with the cool breakout session with the residents, when you're in morning report, noon conference, and the whole day. And so um, be mindful of, of those behaviors um, when you are not in the direct interview, because those are oftentimes the things that um, I have found can make or, or break you. Something that you did that was very kind for someone else that you weren't necessarily watching, or something that was kind of negative. Um, when that was observed by someone else. And so just, just be really mindful about that. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. McNeil Trice. Um, and thank you for all our panelists and amazing questions. Now, from this point, we will start our Q and A. And so what that entails, again, um, we'll be fielding questions from our Twitter, um, also some that were submitted on our Instagram, as well as those submitted here on the Zoom chat. So keep them coming and uh, we'll share them. Our first question is, how have you found that students have successfully engaged during larger Zoom meetings where not everyone can unmute? And this is open answer for any of our panelists. Oh, you might wanna, um... Just pick on us to do if you want to, because <laughs> um, we all like to talk. But um, I would say that little the hand reaction, like if you wanna, is very polite, like that. Um, if you have something to say in a large Zoom, um, the other way I think is, um, you know, hopefully the programs are giving you kind of instructions on um, how to participate. It is really hard when when you're in a big group and you don't want to talk over somebody on Zoom. We've all been there. Um, but just be polite again, like Kenya said, I think if, you know, someone, you start talking, someone else starts to talk, just being like, oh, I'm so sorry, go first, like, 
that that works. Thank you very much, Dr. McPhillips. Our second question is, um, how do you mm -hmm. find that um, applicants can best market themselves if they've had to, for instance, retake a step and how would that affect their applications? Um, and I will throw this question to uh, Dr. McNeil Trice. Um, that's a great question. Um, what I would say is um, to uh, is to be honest and transparent about it and to focus on um, what you've learned from that experience and how you've moved beyond. Um, I, um, we absolutely interview individuals who have had challenges, um, whether it's failing a test, failing a course, failing one of the steps. I've, I've interviewed applicants where that has happened and have matched them into my residency program and um, they have been chief residents, they're amazing. Um, and so um, we all recognize that um, no one is perfect um, and we have um, hiccups and, and challenges in our, our trajectory um, through medical school. Um, my recommendation is to be honest and transparent about it. If it shows up on your application, um, seeking some guidance on how perhaps to even mention it in your personal statement. Um, that way you take control of the narrative about what happened. Um, your personal statement should not um, um, drone on about it, meaning it shouldn't be the focus, but perhaps um, again, telling what, how, what you've learned from that and how you've moved beyond and are resilient through that experience. Um, I think that's helpful um, and from that, um, that perspective. And even having perhaps one of your letter writers, if they know you well, um, can advocate for you on that behalf. Um, when it's not mentioned at all, um, you leave um, the narrative open for um, programs to guess maybe what happened or you know they'll see this amazing application and they're like huh well they failed three courses in the first year and everything is talk i wonder what happened there was there you know a challenging personal thing or were they trying to get acclimated to me you you leave them to try to guess and figure out and so um, i always think um, individuals should put themselves in the kind of the driver's seat um, and to control um, control it from that perspective. Um, and then also be prepared to um, possibly talk about it on the interview day. Um, and so I have had advisees that I've mentored where we practice, okay, how are you going to address this failure of step one? How are you going to address, you know, the repeating first year? Like how are it, let's talk about this, this practice and not from the point of being rehearsed, but to ensure that what um, what you want to communicate comes across. I think programmed a bigger red flag for me when I is when I ask an applicant, can you tell me about an experience where you failed or um, you didn't meet an expectation and what you learned from that? Um, my bigger red flag is somebody that can't tell me anything uh, <laughs> because um, you're going to fail in residency. I guarantee you. And I'm sorry to use the F word, but you're going to make a mistake. Something's going to, it's like, it's hard. And I would prefer someone who um, at least maybe has some experience or even a thought process on how they may work through that or seek help, which is huge, seek help and ask for help and be vulnerable than someone who sees themselves as never having made a mistake and can't figure out um, where they're not perfect. That's great. And I definitely, um, it seemed like the big point is that is show your growth, show your resilience through um, whatever you might have encountered. Thank you. Um, this next question is for Dr. Lefebvre. What are some unique aspects of your pediatric program that would make you want to apply if you were a PEDS applicant this year? It's always a good one. Self-reflection is important. Um, I think from my standpoint, I actually trained in a much larger program and now I'm in a leadership role in a small program. And so if I was to apply, I think I would I definitely think I would consider things much differently, which is um, what is the what is the type of feel you want to have? Um, the aspects of our program, it's a very close knit group of people. Um, it is smaller. We don't have a lot of fellowships. So that's attractive because I know I, I'm a first line learner. Um, and I know that there is not too many people there that I get lost in the shuffle. I get a lot more one to one time with faculty and the faculty know all the residents by name and know them very well. So those would be the things if I was applying, like, hey, that's a that's a pretty good, um, you know, match for me. 
Um, I would say fairly, when I looked, I think people sometimes pursue programs that are much bigger for, for different reasons. Um, we're in a smaller um, um, urban area in a college town. Um, people want to be in big cities with, uh, you know, significant medical centers, um, urban populations, um, more resources, more entertainment, things like that. And for us, you know, if I like the outdoors and I like the mountains and I like being in a place where the community is very close knit and I can be active in that community, I see that as a, a huge attribute to our program too. So you really have to know your own personality when you look to your application and say, do what, what feels good about being there? And I think from, from our program standpoint, I like all those things and I've grown to like those things because I, I've, I've been here for a while. Um, but a lot of self-reflection goes into looking at at the program you're applying to um, and, and the type of people there. Um, I think we also have to reflect on the education. What, what are the roles of the residents in the education piece of the program? Um, how are residents utilized from a workforce versus education? And that's a really fair question. I think every resident and application, uh, every applicant to a residency program should ask, which is um, what is the balance between service and education in, in your program? And I think, I, I think we've struck a good balance with that because we are a small, small program um, with adequate numbers and volume, but we know that we need help sometimes from a workforce standpoint. Um, and we utilize other providers, including attendings and APPs. So those are the, the types of things I would look at um, if I was applying to our program again and would say, hey, um, that, that makes sense to me. And that's why I want to throw my hat in, hat in the ring. And hopefully I like my application. Thank you so much, Dr. Fever. Our last question um, from our social questions um, is for Dr. Foreman Show. And specifically the question is, what does an in, uh, interview, sorry, what should letters of recommendation, who should letters of recommendation come from? Yeah, there's been a lot of questions about that in the chat as well. So um, you'll need three minimum one from a pediatrician or a med peds provider. They count as peds, I would say. Usually I would say two peds and one can be something else. Probably three from clinical. If your research mentor really knows you incredibly well and they can speak to your interpersonal skills and your organization and your intellectual curiosity, they could potentially be a fine third letter, but I agree with the advice about probably having them be a fourth. Um, I almost put something in the chat about being cautious about ad asking surgeons for letters. And I thought maybe that was being too stereotypical, but I would just say, ask your letter writer how many letters they've written. Oh, have you written a lot of letters of recommendation? Because a community preceptor could write you an incredible letter, but they sometimes just haven't read as many as we have. So they might write a one paragraph letter that's like, this student is incredible, you're going to love them. It's like, okay. So I think you can give them a little guidance and say, you know, I think most letters are usually about a full page. Could you please speak to these specific things about what we worked on together and saying, you know, it would be great if you could mention my ability to connect with kids and their families, or that I tend to look up things when I'm in clinic. So it's okay to coach your letter writers a little bit. I think that um, is totally fine to do. And again, just to reiterate, people who know you well, the letters help us get to know you. So somebody who you connect with, and if somebody offers to write you a letter, you say yes, because it means they like you a lot and they're gonna write you a good letter. So I think you can feel really happy on a day when that happens. Even if you don't end up using that person's letter, you can say, thank you so much for that offer. I'm still getting all my application together. Could we meet again in a few weeks when I know, you know what I'm gonna be doing? And then you know if you need their letter or not. But I, I think that's a wonderful moment if somebody offers to write a letter for you. Thank you so much. And I was just kidding earlier. We have one final question. Um, and this question is for Dr. McPhillips. Um, and the question is, what does an interview day typically look like? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think it varies amongst programs, but in general, you can expect to meet with the program director either individually or as a group. 
um, depending on the size of the program and the size of the interview day. Um, you, you will get some sort of overview of the program, usually in the, um, in the PowerPoint. Um, you will have um, two to three interviews. In our program, we have two faculty interviews and one resident interview. Um, and then uh, you will probably have some sort of wrap up session and opportunity to ask questions again. Um, and then you, there may be sort of morning report and new conference that you're asked to attend on your interview day. Some programs I think made that um, available sort of while you, during the interview season. Um, and, uh, and hopefully you'll have some sort of either that evening or at some point, some social gatherings to happen with the, with the residents. Usually those are optional. So if you can't make those, I don't think that reflects poorly on you. I think people understand people's different schedules. Um, there was somebody asked the question about whether they should only schedule one interview per day. And I would say, yeah, like a lot of the days are anywhere between um, three and six hours long. So um, one a day, and I would say probably no more than three a week, just so you can really have the energy to um, show up for your interviews. Like when you overdo it, you, you sometimes don't come across as um, quite as shiny as you want to. And I don't know if Emily or Becky, if you guys do anything different on your days, but we tried to shorten our day. Our, our in-person interview day was long. We tried to shorten our Zoom interview day to about half that length, but it still ended up being three or three plus hours, three and a half hours long, I think. Thank you so much, Dr. McPhillips. And of course, uh, thank you to all of our panelists and all of our speakers today. Um, today is indeed just the beginning. We have tons and tons of uh, great sessions and webinars coming up. Um, and we really hope that y'all can uh, tune in for all of them and get to know all the programs that come through for um, just to share themselves with y'all. Um, and we want to remind you that we do have registration available um, for our yeah, August IMG session and DO session, as well as our regional sessions um, that will focus on featuring residency programs from across the country. So you can register these by visiting our website, futurepeedsres.com, clicking on webinar series registration here is what it will say. And that's on the homepage. And you again, only need to register once. Um, and you can select multiple different um, sessions that you'd like to attend. Also, again, please stay tuned to all things future peds res, um, the hashtag pedsmatch22. And of course, give us a follow on Twitter, on Instagram, and be sure to sign up for our listserv on our website. We have tons of great info and um, news coming out regarding future peds res. With that being said, we wish everyone a great remainder of your evening and we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming webinars.